All these things added. By James Allen. Read by Andrew. Chapter 9. Greatness and Goodness. Goodness, simplicity, greatness, these three are one, and this trinity of perfection cannot be separated. All greatness springs from goodness, and all goodness is profoundly simple. Without goodness there is no greatness. Some men pass through the world as destructive forces, like the tornado or the avalanche, but they are not great. They are to greatness as the avalanche is to the mountain. The work of greatness is enduring and preservative, and not violent and destructive. The greatest souls are the most gentle. Greatness is never obtrusive. It works in silence, seeking no recognition. This is why it is not easily perceived and recognized. Like the mountain, it towers up in its vastness, so that those in its immediate vicinity, who receive its shelter and shade, do not see it. Its sublime grandeur is only beheld as they recede from it. The great man is not seen by his contemporaries. The majesty of his form is only outlined by its recession in time. This is the awe and enchantment of distance. Men occupy themselves with the small things, their houses, trees, lands. Few contemplate the mountain at whose base they live, and fewer still essay to explore it. But in the distance these small things disappear, and then the solitary beauty of the mountain is perceived. Popularity, noisy obtrusiveness and shallow show, these superficialities rapidly disappear, and leave behind no enduring mark whereas greatness slowly emerges from obscurity and endures forever. Jewish rabbi and rabble alike saw not the divine beauty of Jesus, they saw only an unlettered carpenter. To his acquaintances, Homer was only a blind beggar, but the centuries reveal him as Homer the immortal poet. Two hundred years after the farmer of Stratford, and all that is known of him, has disappeared, the real Shakespeare is discerned. All true genius is impersonal. It belongs not to the man through whom it is manifested. It belongs to all. It is a diffusion of pure truth, the light of heaven descending on all mankind. Every work of genius, in whatsoever department of art, is a symbolic manifestation of impersonal truth. It is universal and finds a response in every heart in every age and race. Anything short of this is not genius is not greatness. That work which defends a religion perishes. It is religion that lives. Theories about immortality fade away. Immortal man endures. Commentaries upon truth come to the dust. Truth alone remains. That only is true in art which represents the true. That only is great in life which is universally and eternally true. And the true is the good. The good is the true. Every immortal work springs from the eternal goodness in the human heart, and it is clothed with the sweet and unaffected simplicity of goodness. The greatest art is, like nature, artless. It knows no trick, no pose, no studied effort. There are no stage tricks in Shakespeare, and he is the greatest of dramatists because he is the simplest. The critics, not understanding the wise simplicity of greatness, always condemn the loftiest work. They cannot discriminate between the childish and the childlike. The true, the beautiful, the great, is always childlike, and is perennially fresh and young. The great man is always the good man. He is always simple. He draws from, nay, lives in, the inexhaustible fountain of divine goodness within. He inhabits the heavenly places, communes with the vanished great ones lives with the invisible. He is inspired and breathes the airs of heaven. He who would be great let him learn to be good. He will therefore become great by not seeking greatness. Aiming at greatness a man arrives at nothingness. Aiming at nothingness he arrives at greatness. The desire to be great is an indication of littleness, of personal vanity and obtrusiveness. The willingness to disappear from gaze, the utter absence of self-aggrandizement is the witness of greatness. Littleness seeks and loves authority. Greatness is never authoritative, and it thereby becomes the authority to which the after ages appeal. He who seeks, loses. He who is willing to lose, wins all men. Be thy simple self, 
thy better self, thy impersonal self, and lo, thou art great. He who selfishly seeks authority shall succeed only in becoming a trembling apologist courting protection behind the back of acknowledged greatness. He who will become the servant of all men, desiring no personal authority, shall live as a man and shall be called great. Abide in the simple and noble regions of thy life, obey thy heart, and thou shalt reproduce the foreworld again. Forget thine own little self, and fall back upon the universal self, and thou shalt reproduce, in living and enduring forms, a thousand beautiful experiences. Thou shalt find within thyself that simple goodness which is greatness. It is as easy to be great as to be small, says Emerson and he utters a profound truth. Forgetfulness of self is the whole of greatness, as it is the whole of goodness and happiness. In a fleeting moment of self-forgetfulness, the smallest soul becomes great. Extend that moment indefinitely, and there is a great soul, a great life. Cast away thy personality, thy petty cravings, vanities, and ambitions, as a worthless garment, and dwell in the loving, compassionate, selfless regions of thy soul. And thou art no longer small, thou art great. Claiming personal authority, a man descends into littleness. Practicing goodness, a man ascends into greatness. The presumptuousness of the small may, for a time, obscure the humility of the great, but it is at last swallowed up by it, as the noisy river is lost in the calm ocean. The vulgarity of ignorance and the pride of learning must disappear. Their worthlessness is equal. They have no part in the soul of goodness. If thou wouldst do, thou must be. Thou shalt not mistake information for knowledge. Thou must know thyself as pure knowledge. Thou shalt not confuse learning with wisdom. Thou must apprehend thyself as undefiled wisdom. Wouldst thou write a living book? Thou must first live. Thou shalt draw around thee the mystic garment of a manifold experience, and shalt learn in enjoyment and suffering, gladness and sorrow, conquest and defeat, that which no book and no teacher can teach thee. Thou shalt learn of life of thy soul. Thou shalt tread the lonely road, and shalt become, thou shalt be. Thou shalt then write thy book, and it shall live. It shall be more than a book. Let thy book first live in thee, then shalt thou live in thy book. Wouldst thou carve a statue that shall captivate the ages, or paint a picture that shall endure. Thou shalt acquaint thyself with the divine beauty within thee. Thou shalt comprehend and adore the invisible beauty. Thou shalt know the principles which are the soul of form. Thou shalt perceive the matchless symmetry and faultless proportions of life, of being, of the universe. Thus knowing the eternally true thou shalt carve or paint the indescribably beautiful. Wouldst thou produce an imperishable poem? Thou shalt first live thy poem. Thou shalt think and act rhythmically. Thou shalt find the never-failing source of inspiration in the loving places of thy heart. Then shall immortal lines flow from thee without effort, and, as the flowers of wood and field spontaneously spring, so shall beautiful thoughts grow up in thine heart, and, enshrined in words as molds to their beauty, shall subdue the hearts of men. Wouldst thou compose such music as shall gladden and uplift the world? Thou shalt adjust thy soul to the heavenly harmonies. Thou shalt know that thyself, that life and the universe is music. Thou shalt touch the chords of life. Thou shalt know that music is everywhere, that it is the heart of being. Then shalt thou hear with thy spiritual ear the deathless symphonies. Wouldst thou preach the living word? Thou shalt forego thyself and become that word. Thou shalt know one thing, that the human heart is good, is divine. Thou shalt live on one thing, love. Thou shalt love all, seeing no evil, thinking no evil, believing no evil. Then, though thou speak but little, thy every act shall be a power, thy every word a precept. By thy pure thought, thy selfless deed, though it appear hidden, thou shalt preach, down the ages to untold multitudes of aspiring souls. To him who chooses goodness, sacrificing all, is given that which is more than and includes all. He becomes the possessor of the best, communes with the highest, and enters the company of the great.
The greatness that is flawless, rounded, and complete is above and beyond all art. It is perfect goodness in manifestation. Therefore, the greatest souls are always teachers. For more audiobook like this, hit the subscribe button and click on the notification bell so you get notified when we post a new audiobook. Thanks for listening.